Pictures flooded the television screen through the 19-week trial of a lover scorned, accused of killing her ex-boyfriend in one of the most violent ways possible. Was the picture-perfect Mormon Travis Alexander capable of being a violent partner, causing Jody Arias to finally find the strength to fight back? Or was she incapable of being the pure and perfect Mormon wife? And the thought of another woman taking that from her caused her to take the only one out of the equation that would solve the problem, no matter the variable. The state was painting the picture of a mentally unstable girlfriend, fearing that she was losing the man she was utterly obsessed with. And the only way she saw to solve that problem was to end his life and leave him to rot inside the home he worked hard to own. The defense unwillingly set out to describe a battered woman, hurt by the picture-perfect Mormon man who was a sexually sadistic in every possible way. The world watched, stunned, as graphic audio was played in the courtroom of some of the couple's most raunchiest and personal phone calls. Photographs of Jody in positions that would show the world just what God gave her and explicit details from the defendant who sat on the stand for an unheard of 18 days, taking a stand on her ground against one of the toughest DAs in the game. She was going to sell that final confession, even if it killed her. Those that knew Travis were shocked by what they heard and saw, but despite shining a light on his personal activities, they knew he was never capable of hurting her in the manner she described. He didn't have a deviant behavior and sexually attraction to young boys, as the once blonde had claimed. Her name was mentioned from the moment his body was found, and the detective investigating the case watched as each piece of evidence pointed him straight to her. A woman in love with the art of photography would watch after photograph after photograph were displayed and would bring the end of her reign in the free world. This is the case of Jody Arias. Welcome to the True Crime Librarian. I'm your librarian and host, Ashley. Tonight, we dive into a case of pure infatuation, blinding lust, and uncontrollable jealousy. Jody Arias and Travis Alexander's relationship is one that keeps heads turning even 13 years later. Those in the world of true crime know the story, the details shocking no matter how many times you've heard them. How can a petite woman take down a man, athletic and in his prime, exhibiting the very definition of an overkill? Their lives before finding one another play as much of a part to the end of the story as did their time together. You can't know the story without knowing the beginning. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of sexual activity and adult language. Listener's discretion is advised. If you feel any of this may be too much for you, please skip this episode or have someone listen with you or for you. Good evening, all of my true crime nerds. We have a little tidying up to do before we get started tonight. I just want to remind you that your chance to snag the April design of the month is disappearing quick. If you want to add to your cup collection, then head over to the merch store and pick up a new tumbler, hydro flask, or coffee mug before midnight, April 30th. This is a great way to support the show and you get something in return. Don't forget you can click over to the True Crime Librarian website and hit that donate button if you are feeling generous. Each purchase and donation goes right back into providing you the best quality for your listening holes. If you are tuning in through my YouTube channel, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an upload. Make sure you're following me on social media and don't forget to join the Facebook discussion group so that you can discuss even more true crime with nerds like yourself. Last, let's spread some of that true crime nerd love with... Dallas Carter Wooten, Tabitha Holtz, Natty Kate, 
and Sharon J. If you'd like to make it on the list of true crime nerd love, all you have to do is review or recommend the show and use the hashtag the true crime librarian so that I can see it or head over to the website and click that donate button. Enough of this. Let's get to what you all came here for, the true crime. Let me introduce you to Travis Victor Alexander. He was born July 28, 1977 to Gary and Pamela Alexander in Riverside, California. Travis, he had a hard beginning to life as both his both of his parents, his dad and his mom, were both addicted to methamphetamines. And when Travis was little, Gary walked out and divorced Pamela. He was done. He had seven siblings at this point. So Pamela was left with her eight children and her dive into her addiction to meth only grew worse after the divorce. She would go on to binge for as long as seven days at a time. And during that seven days, she was so high. She was so erratic. She neglected the children and this forced them to care for herself. Travis can remember back to a point where the only thing they could eat was this moldy piece of bread that they found in between like the side of the refrigerator and the cabinet. And that's it. That was, it was his realization. This is the last thing we can eat. There's canned foods in the cabinet, but he was so young. He said he didn't know, he didn't know what a can opener really was or how to use one. So it was just, he was staring at these pictures on these cans and it just mocked him being like, there's food in here, but you're not smart enough to figure out how to get it out. And Pamela didn't care. She didn't care that her kids never ate the canned food because she didn't realize they can't operate a can opener. When Pamela would finally come down from her highs, she would sleep. And it would just overtake her. It would be, she would be completely exhausted. And guess what? The kids were left to fend for themselves yet again. So it didn't matter whether their mother was high and awake for seven days or coming down off a high and sleeping for four or five days at a time. It didn't matter. She wasn't paying any attention to these children at all. She wasn't paying bills. She wasn't working. Life for this family was excruciatingly difficult. There was nothing to buffer between the two sides of their mother. And if the kids happened to wake up Pamela while she was sleeping, she would get up, become irate, beat them, and tell them, you know, wake me up again and see what happens. These kids, they, they had nothing and they were left to their resources. Travis had two older siblings, and then there was Travis, and then he had five younger siblings. For them all to take on this, this role of taking care of the younger ones, that's hard. It's hard when you yourself are a young one. But they were left to their own resources, and, you know, shut up, don't say nothing, let's not wake up mom, because I'm not going through that. The kids, at one point, Pamela and the kids had to move into this little bitty four foot tall, five foot wide, about a six foot long camper in the back of her aunt's backyard. That's where we had nine people living. So when she's coming down off of these highs and she's, you know, sleeping and trying to catch up on all that that her body did not do because she was high, these kids could barely breathe without taking a chance of waking their mother up. And that's, that's not a good thing. It only got worse. And here's the thing. None of the kids were bathing because there was nothing really hooked up to this camper. It wasn't like the RVs we see today where they have like washer and dryers and bathtubs and showers. No, think like pop-up camper style. <laughs> there's nothing to it. There's, you know, there's a bathroom that empties into the backyard and leaves water stagnant, just laying around. And Travis said, you know, if we took a shower and got water on the floor, she would beat us because she would think we pissed on the floor. So it was just easier to go around being the stinky children. Now, here's the thing. Travis was okay with this because, again, it saved him from possibly getting beaten. But every once in a while, 
his mother would decide it's time for her to go and see her grandfather. Grandpa Vic is what he was known to the children. And at this point, the children would get bathed, they would get cleaned, and they would wear clean clothing. And it looked like she gave a shit about her kids for half a second. And I probably can guarantee you why she did this. She was probably going to her grandfather's house and hoping that, you know, I can get some money so I can get some meth. So I can just forget about the fact that my husband left me with eight children and I have no job and we live in this shithole of a camper and let's just forget about our, our troubles, right? So she would take the kids, dress them up, parade them in front of her grandfather and the kids loved it because at their grandfather's house they could spread out. He had board games, he had toys. The kids were actually allowed to be a child. You know, they ate. Things were great when it was time to go visit Grandpa Vic. The sad thing, this only happened about twice a year for them. But Grandpa Vic had a special interest in Travis. And every time he left his grandfather's home, he would pull Travis aside, put his hands on his shoulders, get real serious with him and tell him, you know, Travis, you need to know that you're special, that there's not anything that you cannot do. This is something great inside of you. He had this half a second, two sentence spiel and Travis took every single word to heart. He, he wasn't going to let these hard times with his mother steal from him what his grandpa said he had, you know, and you think about it when you're eight, nine years old, you kind of... You look up to those that are adults and you you believe what they have to say because they're older than you, right? And most people are taught to respect your elders and, you know, how could you lead me astray? You're, you know, you're in charge, right? Okay. So for him to take these words to heart, it, it meant something. And for Vic to say these things to Travis was even more special because... Of what he was enduring during his time with his mother. Things, it was just, it was a moment that he held on to. And it was a moment that helped push him later in life to succeed. Around the age of six or so, Travis had decided that, you know, there was a God. Pamela, she wasn't taking her kids to church. She wasn't your typical mother. She's not waiting in the pickup line at school to pick up all her kids and you know, I hope you had a great day. You know, tell me all about what you learned today. That's not the mom he had, okay? So she wasn't taking them to church. There was no structure as far as religion went in these children's lives. Travis, he sought out the religion himself, and he decided, you know, that there was a God. Now, did he, you know, was he a Baptist? No. Was he, you know, a Catholic? No. No. You know, there was no structure, no, no unified religion. He just knew there was a God. And he knew that if he would talk to God, that he would make things better. So instead of, you know, getting down on his knees, putting his hands together and saying a prayer, he would literally scream at the sky, you know, telling God, you know, I, I want Grandma Norma to come and take me away from this tell Grandma Norma to come get me and take me away. And he would scream this at the top of his lungs. Well, if he woke up his mother, this meant he got beat, and then she'd go back to bed, and he would repeat the process. Because in his mind, if he said it enough times, it would come true. And he was right. There was one point that Norma just pulled up, decided she was taking the kids, and took off with them for about a week or so. And let Pamela kind of get her shit together, or at least portray that's what she was doing before she got back. The kids. And this was a cycle. It, I mean, it started over each and every time. At the age of nine, Travis decided to do something more drastic. He decided that him screaming at God wasn't getting a permanent solution to the problem. So he packed up his little knapsack and off he went to Grandma Norma's house. And when he got to his grandmother's house, he said, I'm living with you now. 
And that's, that's kind of when it, where it clicked for her. Grandma Norma and her husband Jim were Gary's parents. And, you know, they knew things weren't good because they knew their son himself was an addict. So they had to have known that, you know, Pamela was too. But I don't think they were ever fully aware of the extent of neglect that was going on. So when Travis shows up at nine and he's like, I'm living with you. Don't, don't make me go back there. It clicked for her. And Norma and Jim ended up having custody of all eight children. It wasn't long after Norma and Jim took in the, the children that they, they got the news that Pamela had overdosed on that and died. It did not affect the children in a way it could have had they been older because they, she was, she signified hard times, hunger, you know, um, you know, just no attention whatsoever, no ability to be a child. They associated their mother with hard times, right? So it didn't register with them when she did die. Norma became known as Mum to the children, and she decided it was time to introduce them into some sort of structured religion. And she herself and her husband Jim were Mormon. They were both active in the Church of Latter day Saints. And it was time for these children to have something, to have something to believe in greater than they were. Now, there's a lot of stuff going on right now with LDS and Church of Latter-day Saints um, because we have the Chad Daybell and Lori Daybell kind of happening right now. And LDS was a big thing with their case because it's almost <laughs> crackheads. <laughs> no, it, it's, it's like they're using the religion to justify what they did to the children, right? So Mormonism is the fourth largest religious body in the United States. They have more practicing members than a lot of other religions out there. They're not to be associated with those who bring ugliness to light for them. Same way with Christianity, same way with, you know, being Catholic, with being Jewish, there's always going to be the bad with the good. Don't let the bad be the the mascot for them. And this is the case as well. Mormonism isn't a bad thing. We don't understand it fully. So therefore we see it as it's a different way of being a Christian. But if you've ever taken half a second to look into the religion itself, you'll notice that they believe that a person in their existence begins prior to birth. They're a spirit in this world who are waiting their earthly life to begin so that they can learn, they can grow, they can progress in knowledge and worthiness so that once that's done, they can set in the kingdom in one of the three eternal kingdoms of heaven, depending on how blessed their life was here on earth. We also associate being Mormon as being a polygamist. Mormons don't believe in polygamy anymore. There is a group that splinters off that do believe in polygamy, and they follow more of what Joseph Smith had to say when he first founded the religion Mormonism. And he had multiple wives. I think, I think I read he had like 54 wives or some craziness like that. Mormons don't believe in that today. They don't. They believe in being sealed with their spouse. They believed in a blessed life as long as they're doing work to serve God and Jesus. You know, your typical Christian religion. They believe in all of that. They do grow a little further and they're very strict with the law of chastity. They're very, um, you need to be worthy in order to enter certain levels of the church. You have to realize that the the temporary trials in life are a are a way for you to learn they're a way for you to grow and for travis that is something within the religion that hit home for him 
because his early life was so hard. It was so difficult. There were days where the kids didn't go with anything to eat, let alone cold or hot. Didn't matter. They they just didn't have anything. So for Travis, he this wasn't a hard time in life. This was a lesson he had to learn. And he he stuck with the religion and, and it really blossomed him, blossomed him into somebody he thoroughly enjoyed being. The other thing is, you know, for some people, knowing that there's something greater out there than themselves and then those who walk amongst their amongst them on the street, it propels them to do and be a productive member of society. Okay. If you are not in structured religion, that's great. That's fine. If you, you know, don't believe in anything, that's also fine. As long as you live your life each day doing the best that you can do, right? And that's the end goal of all religion. You have to be the best that you can be at the end of the day. When you lay your head down at night, you don't want to lay your head down as a person who took a life, right? I mean, that's the big like, no, no, don't do that. That's how it is with all religion. Just be a better person. For Travis, he really held on to the Mormon faith. And by the age of 10, he was baptized in the church. And by the age of 16, he was a fully active member within the LDS church. His faith guided him in life. Now, while I lived with Norma or Mum Mum and Jim, the children's father came back into their life. Gary was back into their life. He had recovered from being a drug addict, and this allowed Travis and his siblings to develop a relationship with their, bo with their father that they never knew they could have. And for the boys, they did things like arm wrestle, and they would challenge each other athletically. It, it's your typical father and son that you see in commercials that are blasted all over TV. They have that they had that for a little while. In 1995, Travis graduated from high school. He began to work part-time and he started his life savings. In 1996, after graduation, he had saved up enough that he was eligible or capable of going on a two-year mission to spread the Mormon message in Denver, Colorado. We all know these. These are the, the boys that walk through the neighborhood in dark slacks and white crisp shirts and they knock on your door and they want to talk to you about God and where you stand. We know them. They're, they're part of every community. You do notice that their faces change and that's part of being in the mission. You rotate through your companion every four to six weeks or so. So that you are well-rounded socially. And for these boys, the first few hours of their morning, it's spent on studying scripture. It's spent on self-maintenance, whether it's exercising or meditation or whatever. And then for the rest of the day, you're to be out in the neighborhood spreading the word of your faith. Travis flourished here, okay? So we have a, a, a teenage boy, a young adult, who has been an active member in his church for quite some time, and he's very sociable. If you get online, you can look up videos of Travis and him talking, and you can't help but realize he has this spark about him when he gets up and talks in front of people. So for him to go knock on doors every day, was right up his alley. And he was eventually known as Elder Alexander. He rotated through his companions, but yet he still stayed within the greater Denver area. On July 28, 1997, this is Travis's 20th birthday, and he experienced one of his greatest loss in life. He lost his father, Gary, to a car accident. He flew home to Riverside, California, and to be with his family and be with them through the funeral and paying his respects before flying back to Colorado to complete his mission. And again, Travis didn't see this as some poor me 
kind of thing going on, he refused to let that tragedy haunt him. He instead turned it into a lesson he needed to learn and went forward. After returning home from his mission, Travis decided, you know, I'm going to be a successful person. And he sank himself into work. He ended up with three jobs at one time, but he was barely even breaking even in the world. I mean, with when you look at it, you have rent, you have electric, and you have all these responsibilities. If you're not making enough at your job, and you have to go get a second job, and then that's still not enough, you have to go get a third, and you can't put anything in savings after working, you know, 90 hours a week, what's the point, right? Travis was a hamster in a wheel. Think of it like that. He's running, 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 but he's not getting anywhere. He had these ambitious goals, and for him, at this point, they seem so far off. He wasn't a stranger to hard work. I mean, he had three jobs. Hell no, he's no stranger to hard work. He was willing to do it all to get these goals that he had mentally set out for himself. You know, there he, he had to obtain one goal and then obtain the next goal in order to be doing what he needed to within his Mormon faith and have a blessed life. In September 2001, something came along that would change Travis and his future for the better. He scraped together $249 to spend on the application fee, and he applied to work for the multi-marketing firm Prepaid Legal Service. It's now known as Legal Shield, but in 2001 through, I want to say the name changed, 2010, 2011, I don't really remember when the name change was. I could be far off. Don't don't quote me on that. But it changed it. But this is a highly driven multi-marketing company with it the vast majority of its employees are Mormon. I mean, it's uh, it's it's just part they go hand in hand almost one in one. And he was working under his friend, Chris Hughes. Chris had talked him into applying and told him, you know, if you can do this, this, and that, this is what you'll make. So for every Legal Shield, PPL, let's just, side note, it sold legal insurance. So if, you know, you ended up in a lawsuit, you could have this firm helping you. It, it kind of very similar to your insurance. The way it worked is for each plan he sold, he earned so much. But if he would sell, say, three plans, he would he would then bump up to a new pay. So say he earned $100 for each of the first three plans. The next time around, for the next three or the next six, he earned $138. The commission changed the more he sold. Well, I told you that Travis was very sociable. I mean, the whole mission was right up his alley. He sparks in being a salesman, and he ended up making this work very well for him. He had some excellent sales skills, and his venture with PPL and discovering how to utilize it at, at its fullest potential meant that Travis was super successful in this. Not a lot of people can sign on to PPL and make an actual sustaining living from it. It's like when Shanann Watts sold Lavelle. Some people are really great at it. She was. She was She was very much a salesman. And she made a great life. She made a great income from that. Travis is the same way. He's very much a people person. He, he loved to talk. He loved to get up and talk. He loved to share his his goals. He loved to share his action plan into succeeding because he wanted others to succeed as well. Well, if he signs people up like Chris signed him up, Chris earned so much off of what Travis was selling. Well, Travis would earn so much under whoever signed up underneath him. See what I'm saying? It's like a little scheme pyramid thing, right? Don't work for everybody. I'm never going to be involved in that, so you never have to worry about it. I am not a salesman. But 
for for him it worked and those goals he set when he came home from his mission he was starting to obtain them one by one he was obtaining them in 2002 travis began a very serious relationship with deanna reed something we mentioned earlier inside the mormon faith um, was the law of chastity this is a big big thing within their church it states that sexual relations are proper only between a man and a woman who are legally and lawfully wedded as husband and wife abstinence from sexual relations before marriage and complete fidelity to one's spouse during marriage is required they are it's not it's not like it's not like health class in high school when they're like abstinence is the key to not getting pregnant or not catching an sti it's not like that they don't just say it once maybe say it twice they are super strict with this they expect their congregation to adhere to this teaching for travis this proved to be extremely challenging and he would end up losing his recommended temple remember when i said back back when we were talking about the mormon religion that they you had to earn the right to attend certain levels of the church the temple is one of them so you have to pay your tithe t-i-t-h-e and that is 10 percent of your earnings to the church that is required in order to earn recommend you also have to abide by the words and the wisdom of the church so travis earned his but when him and his girlfriend deanna took their relationship a tad too far and they partook in some kind of sexual relations that the church says is a no-no when they confessed they lost their recommend and you have to work twice as hard to get it back now your recommended temple is only good for two years and you have to be recommended again in order to continue that well due to his confession of engaging in some sexual indiscretions they lost their recommend travis does earn it back travis does lose it a second time for the same thing are we together okay on july 27th the day before his birthday in 2004 he laid down 10 grand for a down payment on his first home at 11428 east queensboro avenue in mesa arizona this is a fairly large home five bedrooms three baths and it was just a meager two hundred fifty nine thousand dollars but for travis who had figured out his way through ppl this was a very sound investment and he was through the roof excited he couldn't believe he landed you know this dream home he he these goals he was just obtaining them one after another and really and honestly he goes on to say later he only had to commit to about two to three hours a day to ppl in order to make the living he was accustomed to he that i mean he just got to a point where his salesmanship was that good we probably should have had him as a car salesman probably could have made more money i don't know i don't know what he was i don't know the the round figure he was making annually with ppl but it was good in 2005 he ended his relationship with deanna and in 2000 late 2007 early 2008 is when i told you he lost his te temple recommend again this this repetitive actions uh, of engaging in in sexual activities that are no-no in the church this is a pattern for travis and it plays a huge role in his future here in a little bit i want y'all to to remember that i'm not preaching abstinence by any means that's what i'm saying um to eat your own do what you um feel like you're comfortable with I'm not preaching for you to become Mormon. Again, to eat your own. You want to be in structured religion? Great. You don't? Great. I just want all of my nerds to be happy. That's all I really want. So don't take any of this this way. But I think in, in order to fully understand this case, you have to understand the religion. There's so many 
confides in this religion, I wouldn't say it's impossible to live as a Mormon. People do it all the time. It's the fourth largest. A lot of people are doing it, right? Okay. So it's not impossible if you are that kind of person, type A, you get, you're very structured, right? You don't deal with a whole lot of change. Well, you know what's expected of you. You wake up every day and you do what is expected of you and more. That's what they want. That's what the Mormon faith in an all around kind of way is. Be better today than you were yesterday. Serve God better today than you did yesterday. That's all this is. But it plays a huge role in this case. And I didn't realize how, I mean, I knew Travis when I heard of this case and I watched it unfold with everybody else on the television. I was baffled because it was so raunchy. Some of the stuff that was played in that courtroom. And I was like, she's sitting there and she's not even blushing. I'd be under the table, curtains pulled, be like, I can't, I can't, I can't. No, nope. uh, you know what? Just convict me because I, can't. I don't want y'all listening to that. She was fine. These two had a very explicit sexual relationship together, and he was not supposed to. Let me introduce you to Jody Ann Arias. She was born July 9th in 1980 in Salinas, California. She, her father, Bill and Sandra, they had Jody, and she had a few siblings. Family once described Jody as being very soft-spoken, very sweet, very sensitive, and extremely creative. Jody was held back in kindergarten, and the first three years of her educational career were spent in a private school. This doesn't mean that Jody lacked intelligence. She's extremely intelligent. You can listen to her talk, and you can hear her articulate, and you know that She's not stupid by any means. I think that she lacks the initiative to pull the great that was in her out. I think that was her probably biggest downfall in life was she didn't believe enough in herself to, to, to be a great person. And 11, Jody's family, they relocated to Santa Maria, California and they would stay until Jody completed junior high before once again relocating, this time to Eureka. Eureka sets on the Oregon California uh, border. So she's up there in all those beautiful trees. And they, you know, they're not lying. In Texas, we say drive five seconds, the weather will change. In California, you can literally go from the desert to the snow. Um, upstate California is gorgeous. I would love to visit it. I've been to LA, not my cup of tea. I'm not about the pavement jungle. I'm good. Thank you. But up there where she was, it was gorgeous. A lot of, a lot of oxygen going on, right? We've got some extremely old trees. Oh my gosh. Super jealous. Anyways, she moved up to Eureka and Eureka would be where she would complete high school. Things started to change with this move to Eureka and Jody. Her classmates would call her fa fairly intelligent, very articulate, very vivacious. Others in her class say she was quiet and she really didn't open up in large groups. Jody would later say, quote, I had a few friends, but I didn't really make a lot of close friends. It just seemed like I was constantly making friends and then moving away. I had a large circle of friends, but no one I was really close with. End quote. And my heart's going to bleed right here, right? Because everybody needs a best friend. Everybody needs a handful of close friends, you know, depending on how close you let them, that's up to you. But to sit there and say, I, I wasn't really close with anybody, that's a little heartbreaking. Does that create some wild, crazed psychopath? Maybe. You can go back and you can look. Dahmer was a loner. You know, he was quiet. People said he didn't really have a lot of friends. You can go back and look at Bundy. He was highly, highly sociable. He had, he could walk up and he could turn the whole entire room on its head. Totally different atmosphere by the time he walked out. Very charismatic. 
but did he have a lot of close friends? Not really. You know, you can see a pattern with some of our biggest and most notorious killers who have been studied time and time again, and people have researched through their nose. And really, honestly, I don't think you could uncover too much more about these cases. But the pattern that seems to be is none of them had extremely close friends. Jody blossomed in art class. If you handed her a medium and gave her a little bit of time, she would master it. But her passion fell with photography. She received her first camera at the age of 10, and people that know Jody know that you didn't see Jody without her camera. Her parents, according to Jody, didn't necessarily discourage her art, but they know they made no effort to like display it proudly or um, brag on the fact of her talent. And I can I can relate to Jody in a manner because sometimes you need you feel you need that recognition. Like today you did good, right? Every once in a while, you need to hear that. For Jody, she wasn't getting that at home with her parents. And even though her artwork was beautiful, she didn't feel like she was accomplishing anything. Jody was going to become more and more defiant, and her emotional stability was going to become more and more erratic as she aged. At a young age, she started defying her parents. She started running away, and at 14, they caught her growing marijuana in Tupperware bowls on top of the roof. This incident with the whole marijuana in her ex exploring, I guess, I don't know if she was intent to distribute, I don't know. Jody's dad called the cops. Jody got pissed because they invaded her privacy, and she was a teenager. She's like every other teenager. You tell them not to do something, they're going to do it anyways, right? Only they're going to do it behind your back. They told her to quit acting out like this, and Jody said, hold my Kool-Aid and watch what I can do. And she increasingly began hiding things. She increasingly began lying. It just, it was snowballing out of control. And Sandra, Jody's mother, later told, later told detectives, quote, Jody has mental problems. Jody would freak out all the time. I had a quite a few of her friends call me and tell me I need to get her some help, end quote. And maybe there was something there for Jody and maybe, you know, a session a week or every other week or, you know, whatever would have helped her talking about what she was going through and what she felt like she was experiencing could have changed how she took people's actions later in life. It didn't happen. Jody, Jody was not confident in herself. When she began dating in high school, things just got worse because whoever she was dating, she would allow them to become her identity. If, if they painted their fingernails black, so did Jody. If they walked around in, you know, pink tutus and, and purple shirts, so did Jody. She was a chameleon, and she conformed to those who she thought she was in love with. And her first relationship, very, very serious relationship, happened in the fall of 1995. While Travis was off graduating high school, Jody was entering into her very first whirlwind romance with a man named Robert, or he went by Bobby Juarez. He was a senior to her freshman status, and after Bobby graduated high school, Jody would leave school on her lunch break, meet up with Bobby over at this local convenience store. He would play video games, and the two simply just held hands. There was a connection. There was, there was the warmth of another person who you felt like cared about you and, and wanted to be with you. She was getting that. Bobby was far from your typical all-American high school boy. He had this desire to run away with Jody to San Francisco. We, they were going to go and find the vampires. <clears throat> yeah. And that way they both could become a vampire and then they could live forever together. I told you. He was 
far away from your typical high school teenage boy, right? Now, in early 1996, probably after his little vampire fantasy came to light, Jody called up Bobby and ended their romance. Afterward, it is said that Bobby had to be institutionalized because he became very suicidal. And in the summer of 1997, Jody was moving on. She participated in the student exchange program and she was sent to Costa Rica for two weeks out of the summer. Oddly enough, the family she was staying with had the very same name, surname as she did, Arius. She ends up kicking off a romantic relationship with their son, Victor. Now, this has always been my question about having students um, through the exchange program is housing one that's the opposite sex of your own children. And I fear this would play a huge role because... Jody and Victor became romantic before she went home. And then they continued that that relationship once she got home, so much so that the postal workers knew Jody by name due to the amount of letters she was writing Victor. Victor would eventually be able to come into the United States and visit Jody later that summer. And he gave her a promise ring, but he made his point extremely clear. He did not like the friendships or, in turn, what could be considered flirting she had with other men or other teenage boys, whatever. He was, Jody seems like the person that, that just by being nice, you could interpret what she's doing as flirting. It just seems like that's just who she is, especially with the opposite sex. And Victor was not about that. He was like, you know, if we're going to make this work long distance, I need to be able to trust you. And these relationships make me uncomfortable. Well, Jody was like, you're not going to tell me who I can be friends with, right? So in October, she ends her relationship with Victor and never looks back. She begins working part-time at her family's restaurants. And one of the regulars there would talk to her about religion. And she naively f- believed uh, this old timer about how the second coming of Christ was going to occur September 23rd, 1997. And she was scared. She was scared that it was true. She was scared of how things would end with relationships with other people. And she eventually picked up the phone and she called Bobby. She felt like she needed to warn him about this second coming. She didn't want to see him not get to go, you know, with Jesus and all of that happens. And she she needed him to understand that he needed to make some changes in his life so that she could see him in the afterlife. And in turn, they struck up their friendship and then... Before long, in early 1998, they were romantically involved yet again. As their relationship grew, the tension between Jody and her parents grew. According to Jody, Bill and Sandra were extremely negative, they were extremely judgmental and abusive. One night during a heated argument, Jody says that Bill pushed her into a door frame, causing her to lose consciousness for a few moments. And it's after this event that Jody decided she needed to move out. And she began making plans to move out of her parents' home and in with her boyfriend, Bobby, and his grandparents. Jody does this. She's a junior in high school when this occurs. And after she moves out of the home and in with Bobby, she realizes the financial responsibility of the couple falls at her feet. And in August of 1998, she took a job waitressing at Denny's and another part-time job waitressing at the Purple Plum. Jody's devoting all of her time to her two jobs. She's, she's not above working hard for the things that she wants for them in their relationship. It causes it to where Jody does not go back to school and finish her senior year. And Bobby's left to sit around the house and do absolutely nothing because he's lazy and didn't get up and go get a job. He's been out of high school for how long? Yeah. When she was a freshman, he was a senior. He should have had a job. It should have been something established by this point. But no. He liked to stay home, play video games. 
And while Jody was out working one of her two jobs, he sat at home and called 900 numbers. How many of you, and this is going to show my age, remember back to when 900 numbers were your dirty little corners of the internet, but through the phone line? Yeah, that's what he was doing. He was talking to these girls who make a shit ton of money to talk dirtiness to men and women both. I mean, and nothing really came of it. Nobody really knew the identity of the other person. It was just a good time that the caller was spending a shit ton of money on. But for Bobby, he ends up connecting to a woman outside of nine, outside of Louisiana who had worked through these 900 numbers and the two decide to exchange emails. Jody knew that he had made a friend with a woman in Louisiana. He did, she, she was not aware that the friend was first introduced through the 900 numbers. She was not aware that the two were exchanging romantic emails, but she had a feeling something was up. And with Bobby acting different, she's like, let's log into his email and see what's going on. Pay attention because this is the very first step in a problem that develops for Jody, and she has a pattern of uh, for the rest of the time that she's a free woman. When she found the emails, she was heartbroken, devastated. This was her first experience of cheating. And she really, she didn't know how to navigate this. And Bobby ends up talking her into staying and their relationship would continue as an on and off again relationship. But from this point on, the two fought. And in 1999, Bobby and Jody had a fight that was particularly violent. And according to Jody, Bobby grabs Jody, puts her into a stranglehold. But just before she could pass out, he lets go and she falls to her knees, gra gasping for breath. Jody says that she, you know, you, you don't know what you did. Wait until my family hears about this. And she says that Bobby went into very graphic detail of how he would kill each and every member of her family if she said anything. So her next thought was to call 911, right? Well, he grabs a hold of her arm, nearly breaking it, and hangs up the phone. When the operator calls back, he tells her, you know, we accidentally dialed. It, we were, I'm sorry, my bad. And that was the end of that. Well, Jody decides, mm, I'm not your punching bag, so I'm going to move in with my grandparents in Eureka. And we'll, we're going to distance ourselves for a little bit. We're going to, let's, let's take a break, right? Great idea. Jody and Bobby continue to talk despite the violence in their relationship. Bobby eventually does move to Medford, Oregon, and he obtains a roommate, Matt McCartney. Jody and Matt become friends pretty quickly after Bobby moves in. And it's not long before the relationship between Jody and Bobby fall flat. They call it quits. And in early 2000, Jody moves to Medford, Oregon rents a one-bedroom apartment, and Matt McCartney moves in with her, and they begin their relationship. And Jody later says, going back on that relationship, she felt like it was something healthy with Matt. She felt a lot of spirituality with him, and a similar relationship with religion and spirituality that Bobby did, except he wasn't so much like there's vampires in San Francisco. He was more into the Wicca religion. If you listen to the West Memphis Three, we got into the Wicca a little bit. Um, Jody fell kind of of an attraction with this religion because she really loved the spiritual basis in the nature of the Wicca religion or the, the pagan and she really enjoyed the belief in karma. Quote, what ye send out comes back to thee. End quote. That was a motto Jody adapted and obtained as her own in life. You know, what, what you do comes back, right? But her interest much further than the karma part of it kind of dwindles quickly. And 
I don't know if this plays a part in their relationship or not. Um, it doesn't go on to say, but with Jody's inability to find something greater, she wants something greater out there to believe in, but her inability to find it is really starting to become a hindrance for her. And in the summer of 2000, Jody and Matt find work at a lodge up in Crater Lake. This is one of those kind of jobs where you go and you live in the staff quarters at the lodge and you work through the season. At the end of the season, they both moved back to Medford and Jody landed a job at a local Applebee's. This is where the relationship begins to get a little rocky is after they come back from this lodge. And in the beginning of 2001, the two are fighting. It's no longer a healthy relationship. By that summer, Matt accepts the seasonal work again back at the lodge and he's gone. Doesn't take long before Jody gets that little inkling that Matt is cheating. She can't prove anything just yet because it's not like it is today with technology. She can't just exactly go and ping his location on his cell phone. It doesn't work like that. Not then. Not yet. So she just, it festers deep inside of her and she knows something's wrong. Matt's different when they talk on the phone. She's just waiting for an opportunity to present itself to reveal to her if, if what she feels is true or if what she feels is false. Well, she gets a wish. In September of 2001, before Matt can come home from the lodge, while Jody is waitressing at an Applebee's, two people seated at a table that she was walking past stop her and tell her, about Matt seeing a girl at the lodge. Her suspicions were confirmed. Here's the irrational part of Jody, and this is a part that continues to grow in her relationship with Travis. She, she has no rational thinking sometimes. She decides, mm, I'm done working, and gets in her car and drives to Crater Lake, knocks on the door of the girl that they said that Matt was seeing, and she opens the door and the woman tells her, yeah, I've been dating Matt for about two weeks. She's heartbroken. And Jody and Matt, they're over. She's not putting up with this shit again. Jody decides, I'm not staying here. I'm going home. And she moves from Oregon out to Big Spur where she lands another job working in a lodge. And she becomes the food and beverage manager. And her supervisor is Daryl Brewer. Remember this name because he plays a part in her life as well. By this time, Matt has called her up and I apologized. And please don't, please don't leave me. Please take me back. And she decides to extend the olive branch. Okay, let's do this. I'll help you get a job at the lodge. Let's, you know. We'll try. We'll try to be friends. It's not. Is there something romantic between the two of them? Is something that they neither one was quite sure was a yes or a no. But in the end, let's just figure it out. She gets him a job. And the two end up working at Big Spur Lodge. There's not enough room in the staffing quarters. So for a couple of weeks, Matt and Jody have to live out of a tent. And it's during this time, during that tent, that the two try to rekindle their romance and they end up having sex one last time. Jody says her feelings were completely platonic. There was nothing there. There was no chemistry. And she knew at that point, Matt and her were simply better off as friends. And so the two continue to work there once they land their quarters and they, they just stay friends. In 2002, suddenly Jody lands the position of the wedding coordinator because the one who had staffed the position suddenly passed away from a cancer diagnosis. And in the fall of 2002, Daryl Brewer decides to resign from his position. He's still going to work for the lodge but he's no longer going to be Jody's direct supervisor, allowing Jody and Daryl to start their romance. Daryl was 42 to her 22. Not that this is a bad thing. You know, age is a number. Get it. I hear you all.
But it's just different. Because Daryl, at this point, he had lived his young life. He had he lived through his 20s. He had lived through his 30s. He's experienced love. He's experienced heartbreak. He's experienced, you know, marriage, divorce. Jody's just beginning. Jody's barely old enough to be even drinking at some of these events she's throwing. There's just two different levels of life experiences there. But they had a seemingly happy relationship. And it worked well for the two of them. Anyone looking in... They could not see what was missing between the two, okay? They loved each other. They were good for each other. Um, they just didn't have the same end goals. Daryl eventually quits working for the lodge, and he moves to Monterey, which is about 30 miles outside of Big Spur, and he continues his relationship with Jody, and it continues to flourish, and it's great. Jody is introduced to Daryl's son, and she becomes more of a big sister to him than a possible stepmom. Daryl had a couple habits that were not necessarily deal breakers, but something that Jody pushed him to work on, smoking and drinking. And, and Daryl, he was willing to compromise, you know. I'll give up, I'll give up drinking and I'll work on quitting. Jody was beginning to have goals in mind, too. She wanted to be married. Well, Dar Daryl's already been married, and he told Jody, I don't see myself ever doing that again. And at the beginning, Jody was okay with that because what 20, 21, 22 year old wants to get married that young if you're not already there, you know? So, she was okay when the relationship began, but she, I, somewhere in the back of her mind, because all of us girls want to get married, yeah, somewhere back there when we start a relationship, there's that nagging, do you see a future, right? We all do it. I mean, I would suspect men do it, but I don't have a man brain, so I don't know. It's eating at her because she wants, she wants a husband. She wants children. She wants a family. She wants the all-American dream. It's giving her something to strive for, and the relationship that she's in may not produce that goal for her. In 2005, Jody and Daryl had been in a serious relationship for about three years, and her desire to have the family, to have the dream, was growing, and Daryl was very content at where they were in life. And he still hadn't experienced the change of heart and Jody kept loving him hoping he would give her what she desired most in June the couple co-signed on a house at 76572 New York Avenue in Palm Desert at this point this is where Daryl's son is located and it just seemed best if they all live within the same area so Jody and Daryl buy a home. Here's the the crazy part to it, right? Because we're like, oh, he's gonna, he, at least he's gonna play husband and wife, right? You know, let's play some house. Doesn't work that way between them. They bought this home, but their relationship was 50-50. You pay the bill, you pay your half of the bills, your half of the, the mortgage, you have a bedroom. Everything's 50-50. Instead of what needs to be the hundred hundred that is a relationship and a relationship to has potential to thrive, right? Well, if you have a bedroom and I have a bedroom, that to me that doesn't say we're committed. Okay. Even if Jody could settle for the fact that they were just going to play house for the rest of her life, everything was split. There was no communal anything. They had their names on the, on the deed of that house, yes, but she paid half the mortgage, he paid half the mortgage, she paid half the electric, he paid half the electric. Things were not necessarily screaming couple, right? So there was no sign that Daryl was showing any thought in reconsidering the whole marriage thing and Jody was beginning to get antsy. At this point, 
things are starting to catch up with Jody. She's starting to dip into her savings. She's starting to charge things to her credit card. She's not making ends meet and she's in this dead end relationship. Things just don't look good for her. And her boss at the California pizza place that she's working at had signed on to this PPL, prepaid legal service. And he was telling Jody, you know, maybe this could be the answer to help you out of all of your financial troubles. He gives her the DVD to help her better understand what, what this company is and how you can make money at it. Maybe help her make the decision. Well, March of 2006, Jody pays the $249 application fee and she becomes part of PPL. Whether or not she can make an actual living of this, that's a different story. In the fall of 2006, Michelle Hagen informed Jody about this upcoming PPL convention in Las Vegas. Michelle thought if Jody went and got to hear some of these success stories, that would give her the motivation to really kick this into high gear and, and help correct or help, help her out of some of these financial difficulties that she was having. And so Jody decides, you know, what can it hurt? Let's go. In September of 2006, Jody, along with Michelle and another associate, they hop in a car, they drive out to Las Vegas, and this trip will forever change the lives of Travis and Jody Arias. At the MGM Grand Hotel and Casino is where the convention is being held, and Jody and her group are just finishing up their dinner when out of the corner of her eye she sees this man in a suit, and he's walking straight at her. And he walks up, steps right up in front of Jody, sticks his hand out, and he introduces himself as Travis Alexander. Their chat was brief. It left no lasting impression on Jody. She learned his position within the company, um, but she had yet to fully understand how successful Travis had been with PPL. And the entire interaction just, it just was blah, right? Travis thought, making this great impression on this beautiful girl. And Jody's like, who's that guy? You know, well, the next day, Travis decides to extend his invitation of plus one to the PPL golden black ball, which you have to be part of a certain tier within the company to receive this invitation. But since it was always you plus a date, Travis was like, I'm going to invite that girl, Jody was her name. Jody wasn't so sure. She was like, I don't know. Let, let me go see if I can find a dress. And if I can, we'll talk about it. And if not, it's no big deal. You know, I kind of have a boyfriend back at home. Well, one long after she kind of gives Travis this like, ah, that he's calling her back at her room and going, hey, I, I have a ball gown for you. My friend, Sky Hughes, which is Chris's wife, she's got an extra dress and she's about your size. So you want to try it on? Jody finally gives in, accepts his offer. And Travis takes her over to Sky's room. She puts on the ball gown and the two head off into the night for the company. Again, there wasn't a whole lot to it. They did walk around and they did talk and they cut, they kind of got to know when each other and I think Jody realized that Travis was really big within his religion, within being a Mormon. And that was about the extent of it all. You know, Travis, he seemed to exhibit this luxury lifestyle that Jody was hoping to obtain by going through PPO. But it wasn't anything just overly... She, it, it wasn't okay so the media in this case made it sound like Jody and Travis were one one look and they were in love now Travis told several friends that the moment he saw Jody he knew he had to talk to her and Jody has talked to several people saying I barely remember our very first interaction so it was it was not what the media turned it out to be, but it, in the end, the two, hi, how you doing? Nice to meet you kind of thing. Jody goes back to her home in Palm Desert. 
Travis goes back to Mesa. The two start to talk on the phone. Travis is very up in front with his intentions. He wants to see if there's a relationship that can come from Jody. And Jody tells him, you know, I have a boyfriend. And Travis is like, I know, but I wish you didn't kind of thing, you know. And then he starts to explain to her the importance in the Mormon faith in order to gain entry into one of the three kingdoms, you have to have a blessed life. And part of having a blessed life is having a wife and having children. And Jody per perks up. She's like, wait, what? You, you, you want a wife? You want kids? <laughs> I, want a, I want a husband and I want kids. You know, and this, is, this puts enough of a doubt wedge in between Jody and Daryl that she really starts to question the relationship. Is this something I'm okay with having for the rest of my life? Can I be satisfied where I'm at right now? How important is it for me to have a family, to have a husband, to have children? Well, Daryl, he begins to notice there's an immediate change within Jody. Things have shifted. Their relationship is a little murky, right? And he notices she's kind of slipping on her responsibilities and she's not really holding up her end of the deal and paying her half of the bills. And at this time, their mortgage went from $1,100 a piece to like $1,400 a piece. Well, when you're strictly just waitressing, that's extremely hard to do on top of paying God only knows what their electric and water bill were, right? So Jody is continuing to struggle. Daryl's noticing there's a change in his girlfriend and there's not a lot either one of them are willing to do in order to correct that situation to maintain their relationship. And Jody sits down Daryl and she makes it known, you know, you we have different expectations of this relationship. I want to get married. This is something I know that you don't want to do again. So I want kids. You have a son. Is it something you would like to do again? Because at nearly 50 years old, starting over with a, with a new newborn baby, that's, that's a huge commitment, right? And for Daryl, he's, he's having his own realizations. His ex-wife, she's remarrying and she's moving back to Monterey. This is 10 hours from Palm Desert and he's not okay being away from his son for this this length of time. It's really hard to have, you know, shared custody if you're driving 10 hours to see your child. So maybe he sells his half or they sell the house and he goes to Monterey and Jody goes and does what she needs to do, right? In the end, Daryl decides he's going to follow his son and Jody decides this relationship really is coming to an end. Five days after the convention, Jody and Travis, they meet up at the Hughes home in Marietta. Chris and Skye were perfectly okay with Travis inviting Jody to their house. It was only about an hour and a half from Palm Desert. It's okay, but with Chris and Skye and Travis being Mormon, it was under very clear instruction that there be no um, bending or breaking of that law of chastity because Travis is single, Jody is single. You're not supposed to do these things. So they had their own bedrooms. However, according to Jody later on during her interrogation and during her storytelling time, this would also be known as their first sexual encounter. According to her, Travis snuck from his room after he was sure that Skye and Chris had gone to sleep and gone into Jody's room and the two engaged in some sort of sexual activity. It did not lead to vaginal intercourse, which according to Jody, Travis had kind of played the law of chastity in the manner of as long <clears throat> as there's not vaginal penetration, we're not breaking that law. So, everything else is okay, right? Well, you took a page out of what sexual activity was and said you can't do that, but 
here's another 250 page book for you to keep going with, right? Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And whether or not that's where Travis led Jody to believe or not is a different story. In the end, they performed a no-no just five days after meeting each other. Travis also bought and gave Jody the Book of Mormon that weekend at the Hughes home, and he challenged her to read it. And Jody took the challenge to heart. She she began reading the book and she began talking to Travis about scriptures and about clarity on things she wasn't really understanding within the Mormon faith. She wanted to show Travis that, you know, maybe maybe this is something I could become, right? Well, Travis and Jody, they turned Chris and Sky's house into a little rendezvous port where they would meet each other bi-weekly for about six months and continue their relationship. Sky and Chris, they liked Jody when they first met her, but as this progresses in their home, they begin to change their opinion of the blonde-haired woman, and it's not in a good way. When Jody and Travis were apart, they would talk on the phone, sometimes all night long. They would exchange text messages, emails. It's estimated that during their time together, the two years they knew each other, these two exchanged 82,000 emails. During this point in time, as far as technology goes, yes, email was a huge way of quickly interacting with one another. Text messaging was still not fully unlimited at this point unless you paid like a hefty bill. So for the most part, emails is a free thing. Internet's up and running. It's been up for a while. People are becoming, this is becoming an everyday, you know, a part of everyday life. So emailing was free and easy. Jody. She began to submerge herself into whatever the two were a part of. So together, they both worked for PBL. So she started attending conferences and meetings, and she really showed to those around her she had this interest in, in becoming successful with the company. However, her numbers didn't quite prove that. Like I said, where Travis was successful, Jody lacked it. In the Mormon faith, she, she the more she learned, the more she found a kinship. And she continued to probe Travis about the faith. And it got to a point where Travis was willing to talk to her about being a Mormon. But let me let me let you talk to other people. So he was sending missionaries to her home once a week. And she began on her own attending services weekly. Jody did eventually tell Travis about her true passion, um, photography. She wanted to see that go somewhere. And Travis encouraged her to follow that dream. You know, if that's what makes you happy, if that's where you're going to be content in life, why aren't you doing it? So in 2006, Jody started J Fine Art and Photography. She had a website and an, online, and an online portfolio to exhibit and showcase her talents in hopes of picking up jobs, which she did. They were not frequent. She wasn't consistently busy. So it was her side hustle, more or less. She still continued to waitress because that's where guaranteed money was. But photography and PPL became side hustles. You know, they padded her income a little bit, but not a lot. As we talked about Jody in the beginning of her dating life, whoever she was with would consume her personality and become her identity. So while she was Travis, she was changing into what Travis was, right? You know, we're sinking ourselves into the religion that he is so intertwined with. We're sinking ourselves into a company that he is very successful in. We are becoming what he you know, from from looking into his life, we are becoming what he wants, right? Well, Daryl 
he's still living with Jody in Palm Desert at this point, and he is noticing how she's changing, and it's a drastic change for her. And he's he's left with more times than not her side of the bills as well as his side. And he's cleaning up the house. He's doing, you know, he's covering where she's lacking. And really, honestly, it's over. And it's not long before he moves to Monterey with his kid. And, and Jody's left in the home by herself. And this home will get foreclosed on because Jody just can't afford to pay the outrageous mortgage. In October of 2006, Travis and Jody meet up in Ehrenberg. I might have just said that wrong. I'm sorry. It's There was a motel there, and it was about halfway point for both of them. And they weren't under the scrutiny of eyes through Sky and Chris. There was nobody there making sure they maintained the Mormon rules. And... Jody confirms that these two engaged in a lot of sexual activity without having any supervision during this weekend. And as Jody's thinking that the more that she fulfills these these wants and desires of Travis's, she thinks she's implanting herself and and drawing him to her. But I think the more she's willing to do with Travis shows him that she's no more than an easy piece of ass. I mean, let's just, let's just call it what it is. She was an easy booty call and she wasn't Mormon. So she was not wife potential. She's not sticking to the law of chastity you know, she's not pure. For Travis, this this was an opportunity for him to explore his sexuality without technically, I guess, yes, he is breaking the law of chastity, but since he's not doing it with another Mormon girl or there's nobody there to see it, in his mind, is he thinking, did it really happen? I don't know. There's a little bit of gray area there. With Travis being so encompassed in the religion, for him to disregard the law of chastity in the way that he did and as frequently as he did, it it leaves a little gray, you know. And he's not here to to clarify that. He's not there to to say it's black or to say it's white. Here there's we don't get to hear his side of things. So I don't know. It's just in this case, I find this aspect the most baffling, where for most people, a sexual relationship between two, okay, keep going. I mean, you know, we don't harp on that. But for them and for this story and for this case, I, you've, you've got to have questions, you know, and it's not necessarily what were you doing, but... Why are you disregarding just this one, but adhering to others? Why are you picking and choosing those things within the faith that you are a huge part of? And I don't think there's realization of what mentally this is doing to Jody as well. There's a lot going on. And am I saying that he poked the bear? Yeah, he poked the bear. Did the bear have to, like, freak out and kill him? No, it's not like, you know what I mean? So, I'm not siding with Jody, and I'm not siding with Travis, okay? Let's just put it that way. Let's just lay that out right now. Make sure that it's very clear. I'm not condoning what Jody did to Travis. I'm not condoning what the two did um, in their time together. If they wanted to have sex, great, you know? more power to you. You're both adults. You're both able to make that decision. You both should understand what kind of, what level of maturity that needs to come with that. And you are both highly aware of the law of chastity and you choosing to break it is something that you are given. You are giving the ability to choose. And this time you chose that. Maybe next time you chose to abstain. I don't know. 
But with this case, it is a huge deal. It's a huge thing. In November, Jody begins to notice that Travis, he's not calling her as much as he used to. And there seems to be a wedge slowly being driven between the two of them. And she knew, you know, if she was going to be considered wife material to Travis, she needed to be baptized and she needed to convert to Mormonism. So she calls up Travis and she tells him that she's ready to commit to the church. She's ready to commit to Jesus. And she wants to be baptized in the Mormon church and she wants Travis to do it. The two dress in white junt suits. Travis and Jody step into the large baptismal font filled with water. And when Jody reemerges from the water, her past sins were forgiven in the eyes of the church. After this baptism, Travis seems to come back around Jody's way. He becomes attentive like he was in the beginning when he was pursuing her. He, they're, you know, continuing their daily habit of talking. It's like nothing ever happened during that period where Jody felt like he was being pushed away, right? They appeared to be the perfect couple. She, they were in love. She converted. They both preached Mormon virtues. They were leading life by example in the public eye. But in reality, their relationship was filled with lust. It was filled with sin. And with each moment they engaged in sex, Jody became less of a wife and more of a threefold wonder, which is what Travis referred to her as frequently. Jody claimed later in court that she wanted to conform with the law of chastity because she believed their relationship would be blessed if they did. But it was Travis who was continuing to pursue her sexually. Sky testified later in the trial that Jody was always all over Travis, sucking on his ear, kissing his neck, all of that in front of Sky and Chris and any other visitors that may be in attendance. And for Travis, this is uncomfortable. Um, these are little things that can lead to bigger things in the end. You know, Sky and Chris know they're married. They've been engaging in, in sex by the rules, according to the church. So they know that a kiss on the neck and a nibble on the ear, they cause a rush of hormones. And they then you begin thinking with other body parts. And, you know, the law of chastity goes out the window because your brain's like, well, uh, what? No, we're going to do this because it feels good, right? So there's, you know, I say, I say they both pursued the other one sexually. They were having fun. They were two adults consenting having fun. Did it go against their church? Yes, it did. But that was their choice. It's also said that if Travis made a move, Jody made the same move. If he went to another room, Jody followed. Sky also noticed that it, if Travis was unaware that she followed him, whether it was to go to the restroom or take another call or whatever, and Jody was caught, her answer was constantly, oh, I was just about to knock on the door. Or you know, what? Are you, who are you talking to? Kind of thing, you know? A little weird. It always seemed to happen. But Travis didn't seem to notice that because we've got these rosy I'm in love blinders on, right? And then Sky also noticed that if Jody was smart, like hearing the toilet flush or him in the call, she would dart away so she wouldn't get caught. So there was some kind of stalkery habits that were starting to occur. And if you played, if you paid close enough attention to the, to the two, you saw them coming to light and you began to see this is not heading in a healthy direction. Jody became more sure of her desires of being married and having children. And she was falling in love with Travis very fast in a very short amount of time. And all of those desires she wanted with Travis, she wanted him to be her, you know, her husband. She wanted to have his children. And the more distant Travis became, or like if he missed a late night phone call session, 
it frustrated Jody. She couldn't understand, like, why aren't you having the same feelings I'm having? You know, we're we're experiencing the same things, yet you are having one reaction and I'm having another. On more than one occasion, Jody would sit down with Skye and talk to her about her relationship troubles with Travis. Why hasn't he committed? Why hasn't he asked me to be his girlfriend? Why hasn't he asked me to move to Arizona? Why, you know, what am I not doing right? And the more Sky sat down with Jody, the more she was like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, why, why are it, y'all have only known each other for a short time? You know, you, this has to have an opportunity to grow and to blossom and to be something. And you are, you're just fast forwarding through all of this. And for Sky, it was, it was odd because she was starting to show up at their house unannounced. She was there on days that Travis wasn't there. And as the, as the two used that home as a neutral ground to see each other on, it was odd. And Travis would later tell Sky, you know, Jody says you are her best friend. And Sky's like, what? I I wouldn't consider her a close friend, let alone a best friend. And Sky, she comes out flat and she asks Travis, you know, is Jody just that nice or is she a psychopath? Infatuation is defined as an intense but short-lived passion or admiration from someone or something. Jody had a bad habit of developing infatuation with each of her relationships from the start of her dating life, but no one knew that it could grow to the point of her slipping into being a psychopath. No regard to those around her or what her actions could do to affect them and their lives. She found an identity that she loved to be, Travis's girl, hoping to become his wife. Their friendship continued to grow and a romance was something that he was willing to explore. She hoped to prove to him that she could be his wife. And Travis hadn't hit the point of being serious when it came to finding a companion. But the longer these two were around each other, the more toxic the entire relationship would become. I want to thank you all for joining me tonight as we take a look at the before in the case of Jody and Travis. Next week, we take a deeper dive into their relationship and what would lead the girl next door to taking extreme measures to guaranteeing that if she wasn't the one for Travis Alexander, then no one would be. As always, I leave you with one last line. The only way to win with a toxic person is to not play. Much love, the true crime librarian.